Dear brother, I receive with warmth your letter of February 5th with your wishes for the mending of my cough. I pray this letter finds one receiving it in a far better state than that of its sender. Sadly, my recovery is gravely lacking. An elusive spirit it seems I can but long for. For this reason, I write you, my beloved brother whom I trust most dearly. The doctors in England advise that the island of Barbados offers promise and has exemplary physicians and urge me to make the journey. I will be eternally grateful, dear sir, if you will accompany me to the island. Your affectionate brother, Lawrence Washington. such wailing since the Battle of Cartagena. <laughs> Take care of him, George. I fear he weakens every day. Such worries of your husband are unwarranted. Lord Fairfax swears a salubrious cure hangs on the island's very breezes. Godspeed, then. Godspeed. You know, it's surprising that up until recently, historians have not grasped the significance of the influences that a visit to an island like Barbados would have on an unsophisticated country boy like George Washington. The first historian to really pay attention to this period of his life is the American historian Jack Warren. I'm a scholar actually of Washington's later life, Washington's presidency, but I wanted to understand what Washington had been through as a young man, what his formative experiences were that had shaped the man that he became. We like to say here that uh, the world opened up like an oyster for George Washington here. Um, he not only slept here, he woke up here. Before George Washington came to Barbados, he was a civilian, embarking on a career as a land surveyor. As a member of Lord Thomas Fairfax's team of land surveyors, he'd scouted property for the prominent Virginian, rode the length of the Shenandoah Valley trekked for weeks down the wilderness of pathless woods and slept under the night sky. He had accumulated acres of land, some status in the eyes of his immediate circle, and sent something lacking in his life. Though he was moving towards the financial security that had eluded the family since the death of his father, Augustine, the genteel status he craved, that he saw reflected in the lives of his neighbors, Virginia's powerful Fairfax family, continued to escape him. George's half-brother, Lawrence, was the second son of Augustine Washington's first wife. After the death of their firstborn, Lawrence had inherited all the advantages and expectations befitting an eldest son. Augustine sent Lawrence to a British boarding school where he studied the classics with the aristocratic families of Leicestershire and neighboring counties. But the family fortunes changed a few years later. With the sudden death of Augustine when George was 11, similar plans for George's schooling faded away. At the time uh, Washington would have been sent to school in England, Augustine was, had already been dead for some years. Um, there, there was very little money in the family to support his tuition abroad. Um, 
the, uh, there are many legends about his schooling in Fredericksburg and by a, a convict tutor, but in fact, we know virtually nothing about his early education. What we do know is Washington worked hard to compensate for the gaps in his education. At 12, he copied out by hand the rules of civility and decent behavior in company and in conversation, a book of 110 maxims designed to impart good manners in men of good breeding. Rule 105, be not angry at table whatever happens, and if you have reason to be so, show it not, especially if there be strangers. In the years since their father's death, Lawrence's marriage to Anne Fairfax of the powerful Virginia Fairfax clan, combined with George's natural business sense, had secured the Washington finances. But money without gentility still resigned George to a limited life. Jefferson, Adams, and Franklin had the drawing rooms of Europe. Washington had nothing but the backwoods of Virginia, until a chance journey offered him a new start an opportunity to make connections he couldn't in Virginia. In Barbados, his eminent host, Major Gedney Clark, an in-law of the Fairfax family, would ensure George had access to a level of colonial society unlike anything he had seen. But would the lessons in gentility he had taught himself hold up to the scrutiny of high society Barbados? He would soon find out. The Washington brothers' ship, the success, would have taken about six weeks to get to the island on a nonstop voyage. But George was certainly absorbed by everything going on around him on that voyage. You know, even at 19, you can see the inquiring, intelligent mind of the man, because he decided to keep a ship's log that paralleled the captain's log, and he did so for the entire voyage. Remarks for Friday, 25th. Moderate but contrary winds south-southwest to south-southeast at 9 p.m. Saw many fish swimming about us, of which a dolphin we catched at noon. A constant succession of hard winds, squalls of rain, and calms was the remarkable attendance of this day. This is a cosmopolitan city, a city um, which is the center of trade, Atlantic trade, um, center of commerce for the Atlantic um, trade between England and the Caribbean. Um, in addition to that, you, you find that um, it is also a center for shipping. You're talking about some, some days you might find as many as 300 ships in the Bridgetown Harbor. And in addition to that, you're also um, finding a city that is a center for information and communications. On July the 5th, 1628, 64 settlers arrived in the bay surrounded by mangroves 
which was subsequently named Carlisle Bay after James Hay, the Earl of Carlisle, who sponsored the settlement. Slowly, bit by bit, houses grew up as the mangroves were cleared and a settlement was born. And this was the Port of Bridgetown. To service what we historians call the Atlantic system, which within the British commercial scheme of things required ports to control commerce, three main ports sprang up. London, the home port, Boston in the British North American colonies, and Bridgetown in Barbados. And Bridgetown was one of the key ports of the 17th and 18th century. The first order of the day for the Washingtons in the big city was, unexpectedly, to find room and board. Mr. Washington, sirs, I have regrettable news. Captain Clark's household has been attacked violently by the smallpox. He's asked me to make alternate arrangements for your lodgings. It was not by the standards of mid-18th century Barbados a great house. It may not have even been a particularly fashionable one. It was probably not even a particularly well-furnished home. The house was over 30 years old, and a short time before the Washington brothers came to Barbados, it had actually been used to house French prisoners during wartime. If the house lacked anything in grandeur, it certainly made up for it in location. The prospect is extensive by land and pleasant by sea, as we command the prospect of Carlisle Bay and all the shipping in such manner that none can go in or out without being open to our view. With the housing problem solved, there was much at hand to capture his curiosity. There was a whole new world to explore. George referred to Barbados as one entire fortification. Um, the entire west coast of Barbados was sort of bristling with cannons and gun emplacements, and in the neighborhood of Bridgetown, large masonry forts, the first ones that George Washington ever saw. Young George spent a lot of time examining the superior fortifications along the coast of Barbados, including the nearby Charles Fort which he explored with its commander, Captain Petrie. Prior to his Barbados trip, George Washington had never expressed any particular interest in a military career or in military matters. But in Barbados, with all the fortifications in front of him, meeting generals and admirals of one of the most heavily defended places in the British Empire, Washington, for the first time, seems to have imagined a military career for himself. The other great passion Barbados stoked was George's love of agriculture. He was raised to run a plantation. And when he went to Barbados, he saw plantations not only growing an entirely different crop, 
Washington was used to the cultivation of tobacco, and in Barbados, sugar was the major crop. But farmers who operated in an entirely different way. The earth in most parts is extremely rich and as black as our richest marsh mold. I think that he thought in terms of becoming a great planter, uh, and most of his activities, even his surveying activities, were aimed in that direction. Barbados is, by comparison to Virginia, a tiny place. There isn't a great deal of arable land, and as a consequence, farmers in Barbados had, even from an early date, practiced much more uh, sensible, sustainable, we would say today, agricultural practices. Washington learned about this while he was there. And when he goes home, Washington becomes one of America's most important progressive farmers. But George's education was suddenly curtailed by what turned out to be a fortuitous illness. Remarks for November 17th was strongly attacked by the smallpox sent for Dr. Lanahan. By the 17th century, smallpox had become the most terrifying and deadly of all diseases. Three in 10 died of it, but those who survived were immune to further attacks. You know, Barbadians always like to say that we saved him for the American Revolution and for the presidency, because it's highly unlikely that if he had not gotten immunity by having smallpox here, that he would live through the American Revolution. Thousands died probably more than died during the actual fighting. While their time in Barbados had strengthened the character of one brother, it had disappointed the other. Well, it was a great adventure for George. Um, unfortunately, it was disastrous in terms of uh, uh, the change of scene helping to mitigate Lawrence's illness. Reluctant to give up on the Caribbean altogether, Lawrence decided to stay behind, then continue on to Bermuda, while George returned to Virginia for the spring surveying season. Before his return to Mount Vernon, George had one final stop to make, the mansion of Virginia's Lieutenant Governor, Robert Dinwiddie. He arrived there in February, 1752. Here was something Washington could talk about with the powerful Dinwiddie, Barbados. That would be the subject of conversation. He no longer needed others to further his course. In a way, Washington owed his success and his later political life to the connections he derived out of the Barbados experience. George made such an impression on Dinwiddie that in years to come, the governor would remember him favorably. And Washington would later successfully press Dinwiddie for an appointment as one of Virginia's military adjutants.
Tragically, on the death of his beloved Lawrence, George was given the position of military adjutant, which Lawrence had held before him. How heavy weighs my heart so deep in sorrow. You, great sir, have passed with dignity, having battled for so long in hope of recovery. I will miss the counsel you have given me over time and hold dear its import, especially since the passing of our father. Thank you, honorable sir, for the time you graced us all with, for the intimacies of travel we shared, and most dearly for the entrustments you bestowed upon me. Godspeed, Lawrence Washington, affectionate brother. Less than a year after his return from Barbados, he would receive a commission to confront the French on the Ohio River, a mission that changed the course of Washington's life and ultimately led to the French-Indian War. Washington had begun to make history, and it started in Barbados. Washington never went anywhere out of America before this trip to Barbados, and he never went anywhere out of America after this trip. They kept him kind of busy after this. I think young people today are not looking to our real leaders for inspiration. And, and I think that by putting Washington standards of character and leadership back into the public eye, we can hopefully address that situation and, and explain to people that even though the 18th century and the 21st century are so, so different, that good leadership doesn't change. Honesty, good judgment, character, integrity, those things are just as important today as they were 200 years ago. And we can still learn all those things from George Washington.